like to start us off the day, we're going to hear a little bit from Charma Bonanno from the Weston Playhouse to share a little bit about their experiences in Weston to kick us off. So thank you. <laughs> oh, good. My clicker's here. That's so awesome. But look, it's already clicked. Good morning. My name is Sharma Bonanno. I'm from the Weston Playhouse uh, Theater Company. And I think the most important distinction that you should know is that there are two separate things. The Weston Playhouse... Oh, good. It works. The Weston Playhouse is a historic building. The Weston Playhouse Theater Company are people, right? And I think that's present for my story today. Um, you know, like many of you in this room, uh, the Weston Playhouse Theatre Company was greatly impacted by Tropical Storm Irene. And in the days, the weeks, the months that followed, um, the Weston Playhouse is on the Village Green in the middle of Weston. It's a town of approximately 550 full-time residents. It is a 300-seat proscenium theater, so a proscenium like the one that's here. Um, that was converted from a congregational church back in 1937, and a professional acting company was uh, brought in that summer under the guidance of Boston Conservatory's Harlan Grant for the very first time. So a professional theater company established in this historic building. The building as it is today is reconstructed after a 1962 fire. In that fire, all that survived was what you see here, was this facade. Oh, we're a little hazy there. Um, but in this facade uh, with the Greek Revival building, uh, the flood that following Tropical Storm Irene was the second major flood in this building, although with its back to the West River in Weston, which runs through the village, it has endured numerous minor floods. On August 28, 2011, the Weston Playhouse Theatre Company was in production of a world premiere musical called Saint X. It was about the life of the author of The Little Prince, Saint Exupery. Uh, this, the cast of this show had 11 actors and five musicians. Uh, and simultaneously, on our second stage, we were presenting Annie Baker's three-person play, The Aliens. On our second stage, one mile north of the Playhouse on Vermont Route 100. Uh, the company also had other staff members on campus at this time, artistic, administrative, technical. Weston owns two houses used for company housing, and we supplement in supporting our visiting artists and staff um, with another, that summer was about another 10 rented houses. And because there's not that much rental houses in the town of Weston, our company is spread out over in Weston, in Londonderry, in Ludlow, surrounding towns as well. This is our 2011 company. So this is the summer company. At the time of Irene, some of these contracts had ended. We were probably down by 30, but I estimate that the company was probably about 75 people when the storm hit. In a town of 550 people, that's a significant <laughs> number uh, for us. Uh, good. So the Playhouse has a balcony off the back lobby overlooking the West River and this picturesque waterfall that falls over the mill dam. Ahead of Irene, the National Weather Service anticipated three to seven inches of rain and sustained wind speeds of 30 to 45 miles per hour and gusts of up to 65 miles per hour. We canceled the Saturday evening performance and Sunday matinees ahead of the storm and prepared the basement of the Weston Playhouse, which includes a 60-seat restaurant, a 70-seat cabaret, dressing rooms, orchestra pit, and prop shop. We prepared the, these spaces for up to three feet of water. But tropical storm Irene, as we know, shifted, and uh, we did not get the anticipated high winds, and instead got almost no wind, but 11 inches of rain. This is the back of the Playhouse building during the storm. So not quite at the crest 
of the West River. Uh, what we had was the, the crest of the river came and backed up right over the windows of the basement. So here's a different view. And you'll see the balcony there with the columns. And uh, just below that balcony are the windows down into the restaurant and the cabaret space. So the river crested just above those, above those windows. And uh, it jumped the banks of the river, obviously, flooded the town of Weston, and washed out Vermont Route 100, which passes the main thoroughfare through town. So what happens? In this moment, the power goes out. Um, cell phone service, even on a good day, is pretty spotty. And we have 75 company members that are in our care at this moment. So then managing director Stuart Duke assembled a handful of senior staff and sent them to all of the company houses to check on the residents. Um, how are they doing? How are they faring? Um, some people had to be evacuated. Uh, others uh, you couldn't get to because the bridge to the their house was washed out, et cetera. Um, but eventually we got there, we got into contact. Social media was a great help in that moment. And um, thankfully, everyone was all right. Let's see what we have here. So this is the entrance, the outside entrance to our restaurant. I'm not sure this is quite high water. This was maybe after the rain slowed. Um, of course, it continued to go up at that moment. Um, and this is inside our restaurant after the flood. You see, good, you see, that the windows are, were completely pushed in. So it wasn't even a matter. We've added, since then, storm windows to block some of the flood water that comes in. But you see that it just pushed the window out of its way um, to get into the basement. The high water mark in this area was about five feet. And interestingly, it's not just water that poured in. As so many of you know, it was river bottom that came in. So what it left was uh, significant mud <laughs> in the bottom of our basement. Yeah. It left inches of mud on everything. Uh, and down into our, this is our orchestra pit. It's a swimming pool. And that large object in the center is our baby grand piano floating upside down in the water. Um, the orchestra pit and new dressing rooms were put in at the beginning of that summer. We did $900,000 worth of leaseholder improvements in the Weston Playhouse. And this was at the end of that summer. Uh, so <laughs> it was not a great day for us there. And with those leaseholder improvements, a uh, lot of that work was done in a sub-basement. So it's even lower. And that watermark was really at the ceiling in those sub-basements. And, and so you may remember I said earlier, we prepared for three feet of water. We we're not new to flooding, but this was beyond anything we'd experienced. And again, it was not just water, it was mud. We were in the middle of producing, so the basement was costumes, props, wigs, you know, all of which were put up high, but were swimming and floating in water. So there's the piano floating. The piano was in pieces afterwards. Electric keyboards and the prop shop uh, was just swimming. Um, it's many dollars worth of equipment, as I'm sure you can appreciate in that moment. And the next day, what we experienced was an outpouring from the community. And this is a common story around Vermont is its residents and communities pulling together to help out institutions like ours um, in recovery. So the next day, it was like the cavalry arrived and dozens of community members in our very tiny community who were fighting their own disasters at home came out to help us clean up. We started pumping out water out of the basement. The fire department, the volunteer fire department showed up with their pumper and actually pumped what mud and water out of the basement. Um, and so many community volunteers showed up to help us hose off so much. Looking like, here we are, looking like the world's most disgusting tag sale. <laughs> right on the green in the middle of Weston. Um, this gives you a bit of the scope. I mean, this doesn't include the, the kitchen equipment, etc. was all... Down, the, down on the other side of the building. But the amount of staff that we had on hand was key for our recovery 
also volunteers. The Vermont Country Store, which is one of our best benefactors, sent over outdoor grills, food, staff, and they cooked meals for those doing cleanup every day while we did it. Um, we managed to reopen St. X just a few days later in sort of a concert version. We couldn't use most of these costumes in this photo were <laughs> destroyed at that moment, but we did a concert version on the stage just four days later, which was astounding. It never could have happened without the community helping us to clean up in that way. Um, meanwhile, the Weston Playhouse staff, the senior staff, met every morning, first thing. They got together and determined marching orders and assignments for volunteers and staff, someone to coordinate the, that work. Um, that happened every day, and that varied from shoveling mud to hosing down furniture, cleaning wigs, cleaning clothing, cleaning restaurant equipment, um, contacting the press, communicating with ticket buyers, the state agencies, insurance companies, the outside world, and all the time ensuring the safety and comfort of our company members. Uh, we were also blessed with um, a quick grant from the Ford Foundation, which helped us in recovery. Um, and uh, we were the recipient of a VITA loan, so monies came in right away to help redo some of that renovation. A group of recent company members organized a benefit concert in New York City where news of the flooding was on the front page every day. If you recall, Irene was supposed to hit New York. So every newspaper in New York saved their front page to talk about the storm. And then they had no story. The story was in Vermont. So the newspapers in New York ran on their front page pictures of flooding every day in Vermont. And uh, this benefit really helped capitalize on that press. This is where communication becomes so key in recovery. But truly, we were the most fortunate uh, to be receiving uh, help from our community. That was really what got up, us up and running the fastest. Obviously, repairs continued over the next nine months or so in the Weston Playhouse where we Redid, you know, stripped everything down to the rafters, sanitized everything to the ceiling, and uh, rebuilt all that renovation. But there was absolutely no way without that quick community response uh, that we would have been able to reopen our show. So I know a lot of you have had the same sort of experiences. And again, our communities are our biggest strength in that moment. Um, and uh, that's my story. So thank you. Um, we're here to provide, and I'm an archivist, so I'm all about context. So we want to give you a little bit of a sense of how this network has come to be in Vermont and why it's maybe happening now. Um, my primary role as historical records coordinator is to go about the state offering technical assistance to historical societies, museums, town clerks, uh, public libraries with uh, history collections, local history collections, and other, I've worked with some private individuals, other places that have stuff, primarily historical records, paper-based stuff. Um, and one of the things I found as I went around is there was a real interest in getting more training and support around emergency preparedness and response. Um, Tropical Storm Irene was still fairly fresh in people's minds, even if they had not been directly affected as Sharma was in Weston. Um, there had been networks in the past in Vermont. There was a cultural heritage and art. Um, their acronym was VCHART if you think Vactarn is awkward, uh, culture, <laughs> cultural heritage and art recovery team. And there are some folks in this audience who were part of the forum that they put on 10 years ago at the Billings Farm to get that network launched. I wanted to bring that network back to life and make it a bigger umbrella, not just collections-based repositories, but to bring in other arts organizations, performing arts organizations, places where events happened, 
studio artists, how can we all together, because this is not a big state, there are not that many of us, and we want to try to make this a sustainable network, so we need more people involved. Um, and there also happened to be a funding opportunity available. The Performing Arts Readiness Project had funding from the Mellon Foundation, a cool $2.5 million worth of funding to support performing arts organizations in being better prepared for disasters like what happened in Weston. And we applied for a regrant from Performing Arts Readiness to get a new network going. We were successful and we decided we wanted to do a really intentional process. I come from the stuff side, so I approached the Arts Council and was thrilled to have Amy and Michelle say that they would love to join and co-lead on this project. And we decided we would use our funding to bring in a facilitator to really guide us through this process, um, to not assume I know anything about Vermont. I'm not a Vermonter, I came from Massachusetts. Um, and to really get some assistance in identifying what it is this network might do, who we might serve, and how we can make sure it's sustainable over time. Um, I'm so thrilled to see people in this audience that have been helping us with this process since we had our first meeting last November. And I'm also delighted to see people I don't know out here um, who I hope will continue to be involved and be active and, and let us know how we can support you through this work. Um, thanks so much for being here today. Um, and don't hesitate to talk to us, um, ask questions, participate, give us your ideas. Um, and now a little bit more about what we're doing as a network and where we came from, what our guide was. Meg was our guide in part. Today's gathering to formally launch the new Cooperative Disaster Network is the culmination of 10 months of study, dialogue, and leadership by a planning group of committed state agency staff and a mix of stakeholders from the arts and culture and emergency sectors in Vermont. In fact, it is also the outcome of nearly two decades of pioneering efforts at the national level to catalyze <clears throat> a readiness movement through new community-based infrastructure. So to contextualize the formation of VACDARN, I'd like to briefly <clears throat> give you both a snapshot of the backstory and the bigger story of network building now underway. Over the past 20 years at the national level, there have been two distinct strands of emergency management network building activity. Initiatives to safeguard collections and cultural property. On the cultural heritage strand, it involved, <clears throat> it was focused on protecting art, artifact, archives, and other physical assets. The focus of the other newer strand is protecting people and operational assets. There has been some cross-fertilization between the two, but they've mostly been functioning in parallel. A little bit more about the network building initiatives to safeguard collections. In 2003, Heritage Preservation launched the Alliance for Response program. It was a groundbreaking program to foster connections with and integrate cultural heritage institutions, museums, historic societies, historic sites, archives, libraries, preservation groups, and others into the emergency management infrastructure within a city, county, state, or region. Over time, 26 chapters were catalyzed, including one in Vermont. This program is now coordinated by the FAIC, which stands for the Foundation for Oh, for Advancement and Conservation, change the name, change the acronym. In 2007, FAIC itself began an outreach program to train and deploy a new volunteer network of conservators and other professionals for both online and on-site triage assistance for collecting institutions during and after a disaster. Vermont-based art conservator M.J. Davis was one of the lead trainers in this program, which is now called National Heritage Responders. 100 responders were trained, including a handful of Vermont professionals who have helped large institutions and small throughout the country deal with floods, fires, et cetera. Turning to the network building initiatives for the creative community. 
In 2006, in response to the devata devastation of hurricanes Katrina and Rita on the creative communities and creative economies of the Gulf Coast, a group of major arts funders, including the National Endowment for the Arts, other types of arts agencies and foundations, and major arts services, service organizations participated in a summit to address the lack of an organized safety net within the arts sector, particularly for artists. These 30 arts leaders had served as arts responders, many for the first time, and a few had a long history of emergency support, such as the Craft Emergency Relief Fund, or SURF, a national <clears throat> artist service organization based in Vermont. Uh, Indeed, the summit in, in uh, D.C. was organized by SURF in cooperation with Americans for the Arts. SURF, which has evolved into SURF Plus, the Artist Safety Net, is one of the few full-time arts responders for whom emergency management is central to the mission. From the summit was born a small voluntary national task force called NCAPER, which stands for the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response. For the first 10 years, SURF continued in a leadership capacity, including the management of several initiatives. Initially, uh, the task force focused on artist issues, but soon realized that to accomplish systemic change, it needed to adopt a more comprehensive approach. The early discussions um, uh, were about artist issues, and then there was the recognition that it w we really needed to adopt a more comprehensive approach because disasters don't hit disciplines or types of stakeholders, i.e. artists, arts and culture organizations, and arts businesses. They hit zip codes. And the arts and culture sector is really an ecological system where there's a deep interdependence of all the stakeholders, all the way from individual artists up to large-scale institutions. From the discussions during the early years also emerged <clears throat> recognition of core problems um, due to a variety of awareness gaps. First, creative communities are underprepared for emergencies, not only because they lack information specific to their operations, but they also lack an understanding of emergency management infrastructure. Secondly, creative communities are underserved by uh, the general relief providers when disasters strike because they lack awareness of our needs. And finally, creative communities are under-recognized by the emergency management community as key agents and resources in post-disaster community healing, recovery, and rebuilding. The task force produced various policy and planning guides to address these issues. The first was a blueprint to strengthen disaster safety and build a national readiness movement in the arts and culture sector which was released in 2010 as a green paper for Americans for the Arts 50th anniversary. Among the core concepts were that disasters are local in terms of their impact and recovery process and building resiliency meant activating new communication and support networks within our sector that emphasize both local service delivery and mutual aid. In 2011, the coalition <clears throat> produced a primer for managing arts relief uh, programs for novice arts responders. The essential guidelines was actually a first step towards a bigger long-term initiative, a planning guide for developing in advance community-based arts emergency management systems. The cultural <clears throat> placekeeping guide was a seven-year project which I directed in my capacity as Surf Plus's director of special projects. <clears throat> Working with arts and emergency management specialist Amy, Sur Amy Schwartzman, Surf Plus produced a draft publication called the Arts Responder Handbook. It drew on the initial vision, vision outlined <clears throat> in the 2000 blueprint and practical information developed for the essential guidelines. It went through a few iterations, most significantly after being field tested by CultureAid, a, cult a coalition of arts and culture groups who came together after Hurricane Sandy to do future disaster management planning in New York City. 
The lessons learned from heritage preservation and FAIC's efforts to build and sustain cultural heritage emergency networks also influenced the final version of this new playbook for emergency planning at the community level. As part of the revision process, we, all, we decided to change the name uh, <clears throat> and we coined the term cultural placekeeping to signal that it's a corollary of creative placemaking a movement <clears throat> promoting the central role of arts and culture in community planning and one that had gained traction in American cities and towns in recent years. And secondly, that it is a co collective enterprise which draws on existing assets, social capital and social networks to safeguard and strengthen local arts and culture communities. So that's a quick overview of the backstory. Now the bigger story. What's significant about the creation of VACDARN? Within the arts and culture sector, it knits the two strands of disaster planning and coordination into a holistic network. And also, from the get-go, it is being organized as a cross-sector bridge-building and education initiative between the arts and culture and emergency management sectors in Vermont. Vermont is one of 10 sites around the country integrating the cultural heritage, heritage and producing, presenting, <clears throat> and service assets of their arts and cultural community into a more comprehensive emergency management network. Six of these are already are expanding existing networks, and four are building new ones. And as you can see from this quick list, there are different kinds of, there are different kinds of geography. There's an island, there, um, is a state, there are a couple states, there are cities. This planning work, as, as Rachel said, is happening through grants from the Performing Arts Readiness Project, a national three-year initiative funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to improve emer emergency readiness and recovery, both at the organizational level and at the community level. M. Caper is one of the participating partners in this project. But grants to foster cooperative disaster networks are only one component of a multifaceted technical assistance project which encompasses new online preparedness materials, webinars, conferences, and on-site trainings. There's a very exciting development in California with the support from the California Arts Council PAR project staff, including Jan nu Newcomb, who is somewhere in the audience, hello, um, to train staff of local arts agencies in network development in nearly all of their counties using the cultural placekeeping guide. So besides the 10 networks around the country and culture aid, um, uh, California, one of the most disaster-prone states, will have 20 new county-level arts emergency action networks. So we have the beginning of a community of practice. Thus, the initial vision spelled out in the 2010 blueprint is beginning to take shape. That is, a nationwide network of community-based readiness, relief, and recovery networks that address the full spectrum of specialized needs of our sector and are linked into the larger management, emergency management infrastructure. But just to close out um, this quick overview of the significance of this network, um, I want to say that in Vermont's changing <clears throat> 21st century economy, for the first time, Creative, the creative economy is emerging from its minor position to being considered now as one of the state's major drivers. However, concomitant with the growth of the creative economy are the increased threats of natural and man-made emergencies that could undermine its stability. So the formation of VACDARN is timely and critical. Now more than ever, it's vital to have a mobilization <clears throat> system to keep our cultural community intact. Great. Meg, Meg has really been such a leader in this work around the country and for such a long time, and we just really wanted to have uh, a sense of how we got to this day. And my job 
right now is to kind of talk to you about how, how we got to today, working within the state. I was thrilled to get a call from Rachel in 2018 to let me know about this opportunity to, to work on this project. I grew up in Rutland, Vermont. Um, my, I'm, the, I'm the baby of five. I'm the only one who moved away. I, my 91-year-old father and 89-year-old mother are still in Middlebury. Um, so I was very happy to have a chance to kind of come back. I just have to interject and say you went to high school with Joseph Watson. I did. And we discovered through this process that we were in Bye Bye Birdie together. 1979, folks. Maybe you, maybe you saw it. Anyway, um, uh, do we have the, the slides that I uh, submitted? Are they? I don't, I don't see anything coming up. Anyway. Um, uh, but anyway, I got the call from Rachel to kind of come up and, and working from this cultural placekeeping guide that Meg um, uh, talked about, we thought, okay, it's time to design this organized safety net, thank you, for Vermont. We've seen repeatedly, as Sharma said, uh, you know, artists and arts organizations and libraries playing these really important roles post-disaster, and this was really a, a time for us to kind of put our own mask on first to kind of prepare ourselves to move into that role in a more coordinated way. And that's my kid at Smirkus Camp several years ago. Um, so using the placekeeping guide, it, it, the, this guide is really tremendous actually for this and kind of spells out a number of steps to take and all the things that you should think about in trying to organize yourself to be better prepared. Working with Michelle and Amy and Rachel, we set out to design a process that would use this as a guide, but keeping in mind that this was a guide developed in New York City, in, in kind of a, a tight region, and that we were gonna be do, looking at doing this statewide, and we would need to adopt this for the way, um, so, so that it would work in Vermont. Uh, we also set about kind of identifying volunteers to help us in an organizing group to um, move forward on the effort. So our first meeting was in the end of November in Barrie, hosted by Eileen Corcoran, and uh, gave us a chance to meet each other, to hear some stories, other stories of, of people running cultural organizations who've experienced disasters so we could kind of be grounded in reality. Um, to hear from Meg about, you know, kind of this movement writ large across the United States and to begin to kind of identify our perception of risk, what we thought were risks to the work that we did so we could understand what we thought was important in moving forward. Our next step then was to again go back to the placekeeping guide and think about what this network was going to do. What were the actions that we thought needed to happen to motivate people to get involved and to really help increase people's preparedness. So using this as a guide, we got together in uh, March at the Bethel Town Hall and went through a process to kind of brainstorm what those actions might be. Um, working in these broad categories that were identified here, whether they be research or advocacy or education and training, we, um, we worked to identify potential actions and also did uh, talked about what potential resources there were that might be already be feeling these functions. This is a terrible slide, but what happened after that March meeting was we took that brainstormed list and sent it out in a survey to this organizing group and had them rank it, uh, give us information based on three things. How, how big a priority, how important a priority that action might be, how much impact they thought it would have, if you could, um, sorry, identify a grid, you know, high impact to low impact, and how much they thought it would cost. We thought if we could identify high impact things that were of low cost, that was a no-brainer. But also to understand what might be more costly but important to do in terms of moving forward. We took the information from that survey and brought people back together to then kind of try to hone in on the top 10 list of things that we thought was important for this network to move forward on. We also um, talked about how this network would organize itself and we picked a name. We went through lots of different um, uh, possible names, but we thought that this kind of incorporated uh, a number of elements that again tied together this um, various elements of, the, of who would be participating and, and what we intended to do as a group. And then, again, a slide with a lot of text, but I, I wanted to just throw this up here. I'm not going to read it, but these were kind of the top 10 
actions that were identified by that group that was working. And we use this as a guide to kind of set up today, you know, so that there would be some practical hands-on things. There would be ways for us to build relationships. There would be ways for us to learn about some of the existing resources in Vermont. We'll come back to this. And part of the thing of the network development is we want to hear from a broader community, too, in terms of what's important to you. But this is kind of our, our operating framework moving forward in trying to figure out how we can be most helpful to each other, both to prepare and in responding in terms of any potential um, uh, activities or disasters, natural or man-made, that will come up. So that's kind of how we got to today. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one question, because it's 9.43, one or two questions. If not, we will move in to uh, hearing from Jan Newcomb. We're going to, yes, here. here we go. Wait, yeah. We have a mic for you. We have a microphone. <laughs> How and please, if you could say your name and okay. if you're affiliated with an organization, let us know. All right, my name's Richard Doolin. I'm with um, the Randolph School District. I'm also the EMC for the town of Randolph and excuse me, logistics for Braintree, um, the EOCs. Uh, so the question is, the information that you have up here, how can we obtain it? And also, um, do you have like a listing of before storms, what should we do as a community to safeguard our town halls, our museums, and et cetera. Do you want to respond to that? Sure. I think we don't yet have a place where this information will live, but one of the priorities that came out of our discussions was having inevitably kind of an online presence where resources would be available, um, supplemented with a lot of hands-on training and, and on-site walkthroughs, assessments, and um, identification of how to, how to work together, as a, how to build a team, and how to work together as a team within your community. So that's abs I'm, I'm glad that's what you want, and that's one of the things we're hoping to provide. And I, and I do think, can we make sure that the people who are attending today get the slides from presentations? We'll check with the speakers to make sure that's okay, but certainly you know, we can distribute this.